and we'll record from the current slide. Well, I guess we will if it ever decides to click on. Let's try it again. It's not doing anything. I don't know why it's not doing anything. I'll try it from the beginning. I swear. I... I don't know why it's open like three times here. So let's close some of these. That may be what's screwing it up. Okay. All right. Now let's try it. From current slide. There we go. Finally. All right. Now this. Okay. Before we get started. Um, quick review on what we're going to be doing. Now we'll go out to 315, sorry about this. Uh, but we'll go until 515, then we'll do the last lab for chapter three, and then we'll have the test from chapter three. That's what y'all decided or sounded like you, you wanted to do last week. The lab is a pretty short one. We'll be down in 259, where we were, I think, last time or one of the recent times. Um, and it won't take us all that long to do it single page lab by the way okay it's the only one confirmed that it's probably going to do that for you okay and then the test will be similar to what the last test was about that number of multiple choice that percentage of multiple choice uh, maybe a few calculations a few uh, maybe one or two fill in the blanks I don't remember okay uh, so we'll get chapter started on chapter four Hopefully we'll get a fair piece into chapter four today so that next time we'll be able to continue chapter four, do a lab in chapter four, and we'll just keep going like that. Uh, I think pretty much as we go. Any questions? Especially on chapter three. And by the way, you can have a formula equation sheet for your test. If you don't have that done up, it's a good idea to get one going before the last of the class. So any questions? All right, then this time, for some reason, chapter four is white on a dark background. All the other chapters have been white background with you know, dark writing on, on this. So why they changed, I don't know. But anyway, chapter four is heat and temperature. And uh, actually, these aren't separate topics. They will be done almost interleaved with each other. The core concept here, which you'll find on page 87 in your text, if you've got the new text, a relationship exists between heat, temperature, and the motion and position of molecules. Okay? Now, that's just a sort of nebulous statement. I don't know if it really speaks to you somehow. But we don't even have a really good definition of heat yet. We'll talk about that. Uh, I think everybody has a good concept of what temperature is. Is heat and temperature the same stuff? No. They're related, but they're definitely not the same thing. Okay? Now, motion and position. Yes? Is it heat part of temperature? Like it's part of the. Okay. Uh, not quite. Temperature is a measure, it's a scale of how hot or cold something is. And we got several scales, three major ones. Uh, there is another one that we don't use very much, but it's a scale that just measures how hot or cold something is. The air, you know, whatever. Heat uh, is related to temperature, of course, but there's a lot more involved in heat than just what the temperature is. Heat is actually, and we'll get to this later, a measure of a change of energy, okay? So it's an energy thing. Temperature is just a how hot or cold something is. Um, when you're calculating heat, you use the change of temperature 
uh, because if heat is exchanged, being transferred, you have a temperature exchange most of the time, not always. Now, so these are sort of macroscopic concepts here, heat and temperature, but the relationship exists between that and the motion and position of molecules, which is very much a microscopic thing. So we will be looking at macro microscopic stuff in this chapter, probably more than we have in, in any other chapter, though we'll, you know, this will carry out through uh, the last three chapters we do as well. Okay, so here's the overview. This would begin somewhere around uh, page 88. Now, and this is big picture here of uh, what we're going to be doing, and then we'll go down and break off into smaller pieces. Thermodynamics. You see the prefix thermo? What does that indicate? Yeah, heat or temperature. Thermo, that's usually used for that. Dynamics usually means? Dynamic. Dynamic? Say again? Operation. Okay. Things are happening. Okay. Static would be stationary. Dynamic would be moving, uh, changing. Okay. Static would be not. So this is thermodynamic, the change of heat and temperature. That's what we're studying with thermodynamics. A study of the, now here's the big term, macroscopic, big scale measurement processes that involve heat, mechanical, and other forms of energy. Okay? Big scale, macroscopic. Now, applications of thermodynamics uh, come to systems for energy input and outputs. Heat engines. Example of a heat engine. A car! Yeah, you work on them every day, okay? The, that's your, your heat engine. Heat pumps. What's an example of that? Like house. Okay, house. All your cars have air conditioning systems, don't they? Yeah. It's a type of a heat pump right there. So again, okay, and refrigeration, any of that, deal with the heat pump, and refrigerators, they mentioned that too. Okay, these are based on, but not concerned with, the microscopic details. All this stuff, even though macroscopic processes, they're based on, but not really concerned with what's happening on the microscopic scale, the atomic scale, the okay, molecular scale. So, the approach here in this chapter will talk about the underlying microscopic processes that support all this other stuff. We'll relate those microscopic and macroscopic views, and then finally we'll get around to talking about the laws, studying the laws of thermodynamics. If you look that up, you would probably see that people usually talk about the three laws of thermodynamics. Seem like three is very popular. Newton's three laws, you know, stuff like this. Well, these are three laws of thermodynamics. However, certain people have said, you know, there really has to be a fourth law that underlies and supports the other three. So, uh, but everybody had been talking for years, like decades, centuries, about the three laws of thermodynamics, but this fourth one was fundamental to the others, so rather than call it the fourth law, they called it the zeroth law. Now this book doesn't address that. If there's time, I may mention it and uh, come back to it. In fact, we only are going to talk about two laws of thermodynamics, but I'll mention the third one as well, and then possibly even the fourth, which is the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Okay. We'll focus on just two. So as we said, we're going to start with the microscopic, molecular theory. What's going on at the molecular level? Okay, now this is a theory. No one really knows what's going on at the molecular level, level because no one can see what's going on at the molecular level. You can't measure what's going on at the molecular level, but the theory supports this, and the, the theory is based on this. It's a collective set of hypotheses, multiple ones, about the particulate nature of matter and its surrounding space. Now, let's go back in time to the very ancient, the Greeks, 
Um, they were the first to come up with this concept of atoms. Okay? Democritus was the Greek who first wrote about that. I think I described it to you before. His thought process here was if I have a piece of material, whatever it is, iron, whatever, okay, and I break it into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, at some point I get down to the smallest piece of iron I could possibly have and it's still the iron. And he called that the atom, which means indivisible. Okay? Can't take it any smaller. Okay? Well, about 100 years or so after Democritus, here came Aristotle, and he didn't like that theory. He said, no, no, matter is a continuum. There's no smallest piece you have. As small as you get, it's still, it's still iron. So he poo pooed the idea of, of atoms. Okay? even though the market has come up with it. Well, many years later, we found out they had to be made out of that because it did seem to be the smallest part of it. So we still use the name that the market has thought about because he couldn't see them not in that way. The current view, matter is composed of microscopic particles, atoms, but they combine to form molecules. Now, atoms are the smallest particle of a given element. The things that are listed in your periodic table, those are the elements. Okay? And if you don't have a big book like this with the periodic table in the back, uh, I only see one small thin book. I think it may have a two. Let me see. The previous days, no, I asked them to put it in. They didn't. Okay. But it's in chapter 8, which is in your book, uh, if you have the small one. It's in there as well. But for those with the big books, it's on the back inside cover. Everything listed there, smartest particle of that is an atom. Okay? But these various atoms, only plus or minus of 100 of those, some of those are very rare, by the way, uh, but when they combine, they form molecules. Now, a molecule is the smallest particle that a compound can exist, okay? For instance, name something that's a compound, or at least, yeah, water. The smallest piece of water you could ever have would be a molecule of water. And as you just described it, it's made up of two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. But of course, it looks nothing like hydrogen and oxygen. It's water. It's a completely new material because they're combined chemically. So the smallest particle that an element can be is the atom, but the smallest particle that a molecule, uh, that a compound can be, would be a molecule. Okay. Many macroscopic phenomena can be traced to the interactions on the microscopic level between molecules and even between atoms. All right. Now, there's some pretty good figures in the book, uh, especially if you got the new book. Some of these are fairly new and, and nicely done. Um, they're talking about heat and modern technology being inseparable. These are some steel slabs in a steel processing plant. <laughs> to get them to that, to get anything like this to those kind of levels, you're adding a lot of heat to, to, uh, to melt, to change, to, to, to modify things. I don't know if you thought about it, but to make aluminum foil, you got to heat that aluminum to extraordinarily high temperatures and then roll it out while it's very, very hot into that very, very thin uh, sheets that would make aluminum foil. Same thing with this. Any piece of metal uh, that you might have here, has been heated to get down to the thickness that you're dealing with and then uh, shaped while it is very, very high temperature. The next, the figure 14.2, page 89, is what we're going to talk about next. I, yeah, let's go on and hit that and then we'll come to this figure. Let's talk about those molecules we just mentioned. You have chemical elements those are made up of individual atoms. 
No mixture of atoms except two of the same type, often, or multiple ones of the same type. But the chemical elements defined by each unique type of atom. Carbon is always carbon. That's all it's got in it. If it's pure carbon, that's the only atom in that. Most things are not absolutely pure. But what is a pretty risky material that's made out of pure carbon? Diamond. Diamond, okay. Uh, another is something you might use in your uh, everyday work experience, graphite. Graphite is pure carbon, okay, if it's pure graphite. We can tell if it's graphite is not pure, but you know. Now, graphite is used for what? Say again? Writing. You're absolutely right. Uh, okay. Lubricating, exactly. So here's pure carbon. Graphite is used as a lubricant. It keeps things from rubbing against each other. It reduces friction. That's in one form. Yeah. Then why does it write so well? Okay, well, that's because it slides over the paper. Okay. And now that lead. Sliding, huh? It's breaking down and just sliding. Is that okay, right? actually, there's more in that than pure carbon. Oh. Okay. Anyone know what else other material is in that? Lead. No, it's called lead, but it's yeah, it's not. Down into one kind of okay. Lead. It's actually a clay material called kaolinite. I don't know if you, I imagine this is kaolinite mine, mine, mine somewhere in the state of Alabama, but I know there is over in Georgia. Uh, there's some fairly big kaolinite mines. Uh, it seems like oh, down around uh, Eastern part of the state used to be one near Hampton, Georgia. But I don't know if that's still in effect, but I think there's one near Macon or maybe more than one. Pretty big uh, plants there that that purify and and uh, and, and separate kaolinite clay from the soil. Well, they mix the lead, and you know you have different grades of lead. This is probably number two. And this isn't lead. Okay, it's lead and pencil. This is number two, which is sort of a medium hardness. Number one is much softer, and number two, three, or four are much harder. Well, the harder it is, the more kaolinite, less graphite, and the softer it is, there's less kaolinite, more graphite. Uh, when you get down to pure graphite, that's almost soot, okay, uh, that you would find in the chimney or somewhere. And that's pretty slick stuff, okay? Now, so the graphite and the clay, because they're such small particles, it glides across the page, but actually the reason it sticks is that it gets picked up by the graininess of the paper. That's why a glossy piece of paper, and guess what makes it glossy? A layer of kaolinite, okay? Uh -huh. And that keeps, and those are hard to write on, okay? The glossier it is, like the front cover of the book, yeah, it hardly makes a mark on it because that's so glossy. The, the pages like this, there's a very, very small roughness to it, okay? And that's why the, uh, that then you can write on that because, and it's actually picking up pieces of the lead and tail on it, okay? So, let's get back to it. Here, one form of carbon is a lubricant, okay? And yet the other form, diamond, is the most, the hardest abrasive you can have. What do they use diamond for besides wings, rings and stuff? Drill bits. Yes, exactly. The hardest drill bit or, or saw blade is diamond crusted, okay? Because nothing is harder than diamond. Nothing. It's number 10 on the most hardness scale. So here we have one form of carbon that's a lubricant that keeps things from, from uh, being abrasive, and the other is the most abrasive thing. The difference here is the structure of those compounds. Graphite is a two-dimensional structure, and that's what makes it slick. Things slide past each other so well, whereas diamond is a three-dimensional uh, crystal structure, which is the hardest material that those chemical bonds are extraordinarily strong. Okay, now, those are elements. Compounds 
They're pure substances like water, carbon dioxide, sugars, salt, you know, all these things are compounds made up of two or more atoms that are chemically bonded together. When they say chemically bonded, that changes the nature of the material. Because what is hydrogen, by the way? We talked about it last time. Hydrogen. It's a gas. The lightest gas that you have. What's the characteristic of it? Hindenburg. Uh, yes, very flammable, explosive, right? Okay. Hydrogen gas, explosive, very flammable. Oxygen, also a gas. And they're both also very flammable. Okay. It's actually the one thing that's required to support combustion. Okay. Anything that burns is going to be oxidizing, at least the way we think of it, right? So here they form chemically to make a substance that we do what with? Put out fires. Okay, yeah. So that will not burn and we also drink it. Oh, yeah. 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 So we drink Okay. Okay. Yes, that you use to put out fires. Okay. Makes sense, huh? Another example. Anyone know what pure sodium is? Metal. It is a metal. It's a very soft metal. It's not a metal like you think of this being a metal, but it is classified a metal, very soft. I think it's usually sort of a yellowish color, uh, but you seldom see sodium. Seldom see pure elemental sodium for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's extraordinarily reactive. If sodium exists, it's used as one to combine with something as quickly as it can. Okay? Now, if you ever see it in a chemistry lab, you'll always see it in a jar underneath oil. You'll see the sodium substance, that, that solid down there. And it's not a very hard metal either, it's sort of a soft metal, okay, uh, down there under oil. Any idea why it would be under oil? Because it doesn't react with oil? It doesn't react with oil, and what would it react with? Water. Water. Okay. It explodes big time when you, it reacts with water. Okay? An explosive solid sodium is that you don't let touch water. And there's if, water in our air. There's water in the air. There's water on your skin, in your body. If the sodium hit you, you're going to burn like crazy because it's reacting with that water. So, What's that? Uh, that would be pretty tough to do, probably, but I guess they could, but it's a pretty rare to find it elemental sodium. Okay, let's take another element. Chlorine. Anyone know what chlorine is? It's a gas. It's a green gas. Okay. I think sodium is sort of yellowish color. Chlorine is a green gas. It's, it is very poisonous. Okay? If you ever see the tanker cars that go down trains or go start to it that have tanks of chlorine warning you to stay away from it, if they ever had a, a um, spill or a wreck or something like that, clear the area because Say again? Somebody swing it. Yeah, see. So there's a poisonous gas. A soft metal that's extraordinarily explosive and a green poisonous gas. And when you combine them chemically, what do they form? You're eating something. Salt. Salt. NaCl, you're eating what was an explosive gas, I mean a solid, that would burn you like crazy if you tried to eat it, or a poisonous gas that would kill you if you tried to eat it. But when they combine chemically, they're a brand new substance, a white to colorless crystal structure that we use to flavor our foods and we eat it all the time. Okay? That's how compounds, when they say chemically bonded, that means their, their properties change big time. All right, molecule. Smallest unit retaining the properties of a compound, whereas atom would be the smallest unit retaining the properties of the gas, of the element. Okay? Um, now, 
This is sort of an example. Compound is a macroscopic term, salt, you know, things like that, macroscopic. Okay, the element, the uh, the molecules, microscopic. I mean, submicroscopic. Okay, element is defined oxygen, iron, whatever, uh, carbon. But that's a ma macroscopic concept. But the atom, that's the actual particle of that, is definitely microscopic, submicroscopic. So the molecule is the smallest unit retaining the properties of that given compound. The shorthand here, now quite often we'll say a molecule of iron, okay? That could be a single atom of iron as well. Now if you say a molecule of oxygen though, that's not an atom of oxygen. Does anyone know why? Same thing true of chlorine, by the way. Oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, chlorine, Iodine, uh, a molecule of oxygen. Oh, it's diatomic. It's diatomic. Two atoms. Oxygen doesn't exist as oxygen. Just a single atom of oxygen. It always is in a pair because oxygen is going to combine with something, even if it's itself. Okay, it's going to always combine with something. So will fluorine. So will fluorine. So will nitrogen. So will you know lots of things like that. Okay. So a molecule could be a single atom, or it could stand for two or more atoms put together, sometimes the same atom, sometimes not, okay? So usually we let molecules stand for the smallest unit, whether it's an element or a compound. All right, let's look at molecular So let's look at molecular interactions. Most molecular interactions are attractive, okay? When sodium is out there, it's going to combine with something, whether it's water or chlorine or something, and they stick together and make that new material, causing materials to cling together. Okay? There's a couple of ways that materials do cling. One is called cohesion. That's attractive forces between like molecules. Okay? Uh, water, and we've seen this in lab, whether you've noticed it or not, when you were filling containers with water, if you ever notice the ash one here, okay. Uh, when you were filling those, did you notice that the water actually can overfill the container? You keep adding water, and you see that the surface of water is above the surface of the canyon, but it's not spilling yet. That's because water molecules hang on to each other with an enormously fierce strength, okay? Uh, that's called hydrogen bonding. Because water molecules, by the way, you said it was H2O. Does that mean it's an H here, an O here, and an H there? No. Most of our most reactive elements, most of them, uh, have in their outer electron shells, that's where all the action's going on pretty much is outer electron shells, um, pairs of electrons. Now those pairs in the outer shell for the, the at, that atom to be happy, it has four pairs of electrons. Eight electrons in the outer shell, and it's a happy capital. Okay, it's good time. But if it doesn't, then it's trying to do something to get those at full shell. Okay? For instance, on the far right column of your periodic table, here is helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon. Anyone know what they are called? Noble gases. Noble gases. Now, what makes them noble? They're the okay. Huh? When, uh, when charged with electricity, they, they glow. Really? I didn't know that. Well, I mean, neon. They all do it. Yeah, they, they all do. But the thing is, the, the thing that's about them is they've got filled outer electron shells. Okay. They don't react with anyone. It's like nobility. They don't mix with the common people, you know. Nothing else combines with neon, helium, you know, or anything else. They, and they're all gases. 
even radon, which has a molecular mass of about 222. You won't find any other gas ever with that big a molecule, ever, okay? Most of your things are much smaller than that, and yet it's still a gas because it won't react with anything else to make bigger uh, molecules, okay? So, they like to have eight, four pairs of electrons together. Well, oxygen is that way too, only it only has eight, I mean six electrons in its outer shell. So you have two pairs, and then you have another two that don't have pairs. They don't pair up because they, they get as far away from each other as they can. So you have two pairs and two singles, and that makes up the six, okay? Now, the structure that typically they would have is you have a three-dimensional structure with four corners, you might say, that doesn't make a square. Think three-dimensional. You have one here, one here, one there, one here. So they actually make triangles, okay? And we call that a tetrahedral structure because it's four triangles, one on the base, two on the and three on the side. Yeah. That would be the tetrahedral structure. So, two of those electron pairs, and if you can think of this, tetrahedral structure there, two of them are always adjacent to every other one, you know? Can't have it any other way. So, if you have two that are, have four electrons, pairs of electrons, they're like this, or here, or here, or here, or here, but they're always next to each other. And the two that are singles, they're also in the other two places, always next to each other. Well, those two singles, those, com those combine with the hydrogen. Okay? So now we have hydrogen, and they sort of rip off the, the electron from the hydrogen, so it spins around both of them. That's what makes the strong bond. That makes the oxygen in a bit negative because the hydrogen in, since they're grabbing that electron, the hydrogen in tends to be positive because the electron is more often in between, so you have an exposed proton. Hydrogen is just one proton, one electron. Okay, and if oxygen is sucking up the electron for part of the time, that leaves a bare proton here on this end. And on this end, you have two pairs of electrons unmatched with anything, so that tends to be negative. So we say that water is a polar molecule. It's a dipole, a positive end, a negative end. Okay? And because of that, then the positive end of this water molecule is going to attach to the negative end of that water molecule. This positive end will attach to a negative end of another, and they form a structure that really hangs together. Okay? That's what makes it a liquid. Because most things, the molecular weight of water is 16 for high, uh, uh, oxygen, 1 for hydrogen, 1 for hydrogen, 18. You won't find any other liquids that have that small of molecular weight. And that's because of that strong hydrogen bond. Okay. What got me off on that? Okay. That's just showing cohesion between white molecules. The hydrogen bonding of water. Okay. There's another kind that's called adhesion. Now that almost sounds like adhesive tape, which sticks different things together, right? These are attractive forces between unlike molecules. Okay? For instance, salt and water. Okay? Salt is sodium chlorine, sodium positive, chlorine is negative. It's a it's a ionic molecule. Water will dissolve salt like crazy, okay? And so therefore, it's attracting uh, an unlike molecule. Now, um, water wetting the skin, that's uh, a form of adhesion. Now, of course, unless you have a little oil on your hand, will it wet the skin very well then? No, because oil is a nonpolar molecule and water and oil don't mix. They don't attract each other. They repel each other. Okay? So what you have to have then is what? To wash your hands when you got oily or greasy soap. skin. A soap, which actually is what they call a surfactant. Okay? 
that makes for an active surface so that it now allows water to get through and it, it sort of blocks the, the nonpolar from the polar and now water can rinse it off. And that's all soap is. Soap is not uh, killing germs or other things like this. Now they can put any bat bacterial stuff into a uh, soap that, that would do that. But basically soap is just wetting things better. It's increasing the surface, decreasing the surface tension of water and of the other material. Okay? Any glue mechanism, that's why they call it adhesive, because it's sticking things together that are this something. Okay. There are other reactions that can be repulsive, like I just said. Water and oil, water and wax, water and you know uh, anything that's a non-polar molecule. Uh, water would be repulsive to that, and it would be repulsive to water. Okay, anytime water beads up, that means that. A sort of a classic example of this, and I don't know if you've noticed it or not. Now we haven't done much with thermometry in the lab yet, have we? Really? Yeah, this chapter will really get into. And when you see your thermometers, you'll see these two types of them. Some of them have sort of a reddish kind of liquid in it. Does anyone know what that is? No, that's alcohol. Okay. And if it's the silvery stuff, that's probably mercury. And if you look at those closely, even though those are very, very fine capillary tubes there, and it's hard to see this, but on the alcohol, you'll know because alcohol and water do mix well, and the alcohol and glass react well, the alcohol will actually climb up the sides of the capillary tube. And what you do is measure the meniscus, which is at the bottom of that curve. So on the mercury, and you look at that carefully, mercury beads up, okay, and you'll read the top of that because that's the uh, meniscus is on top. Because mercury doesn't like to mess with glass. It wants to only mess with mercury. It's very cohesive to other mercury molecules and doesn't adhere to glass well at all. And that's why if you've ever, I can remember people doing this when I was uh, in grade school or junior high, somehow they get some mercury, they broke the thermometer, they did something, bring it in and play with it. My parents talked about that in high school. Say what? They used to do that. My parents used to do that yeah. in high school. Okay. And why is that not a good idea? Yeah, it's really hot. It's uh, what they call not just a, uh, a type of music, but it's a heavy metal that really can um, the re, re, uh, what I'm trying to think of, um, make development, you know, mental development and stuff like this go pretty poorly. Okay, so you don't want mercury mixed into your uh, system, so you don't want to be handling it. But what made it fun is you. If you spilled it, and you know, I've seen mercury spilled before, it always beads up in little bitty balls. And it looks like it's solid till you touch it, and it flattens out because it's a liquid. So it's always in perfect little spheres, okay? Because it's cohesing with each other, with the mercury molecules, not wanting to adhere to anything. Unless you have a coin. Now, I can remember people doing this too, especially a copper coin like a penny got copper in it, it will adhere to copper and it will just slide all over that and make it look like a diamond because mercury is very silvery looking and you know people always thought, oh, I can make money, I can use this as a diamond, I don't know if people want to realize that, but it's also, you don't want to handle a lot of mercury because you're now exposing yourself to a popular material. Okay, so that's what's going on on the molecular level. Okay, let's look at the picture here, or the figure 4.2. These are some metal atoms appear in a micrograph of the crystal of titanium niobium oxide, okay, magnified 7,800,000 times, okay. That is some powerful microscope. That's with an electron microscope. You're banging electrons onto it catching the image of the electron bouncing off, okay? That's as close as you can ever get to see an individual atom. You're not really seeing it, but you're seeing where one would fit, okay? Um, so, 
And by the way, most solids form crystal structure like you saw. See if you got that picture there. All right. Next thing are the phases of matter. Okay. Now, I can remember back when I was in very young science age, they used to call these the states of matter. I don't know if you've heard they called that. And they were, what were they? Solid. Solid. Liquid. And? Gas. Okay. Is that all? Plasma. Ah, there is a fourth state. We never talked about that then. Plasma. Okay. Um, now they don't call them states because now that quantum mechanics is a thing, state is used as an energy level. So they don't want to call them states of matter, they now call them phases of matter. Okay. Uh, because state is means it has a different meaning in quantum mechanics that they keep them confused. So they're now called the phases of matter. Solids. What characterizes a solid as a solid? Second? Okay. What you mean by hard is I take it it has a fixed shape. That's solid. Okay? Fixed shape and I can call it fixed body. Okay? Those are the two things that define what a solid is. Now where does that come from? That's a macroscopic observation. Microscopically, why is it? It has a rigid three-dimensional structure. In other words, those atoms and molecules that make up whatever it is, they are fixed in place of rigid structure. So you have a molecule here, a molecule there, a molecule, you know, they're fixed in place, they don't do any sliding past each other. If they did, that would be a liquid, okay? So they have a rigid three-dimensional structure. Now, some have more two-dimensional, uh, but uh, usually, most of the time, three-dimensional structure. The atoms and the molecules are bonded two ways, in proximity to each other, for sure, but also fixed in place. They don't fly past each other. They're in that three-dimensional structure and do not move from the only allowed motions uh, are restricted to vibration, okay? And no matter what it is, it's always moving, okay? Even fixed within that shape, there's always movement, and that the only movement they can have is vibrational motion, because nothing is ever really stationary down on the microscopic level, okay? Only motions allowed are vibration. All right. If this were an illustration of that, then, and this is somebody's model. This isn't really what's happening, but you kind of imagine they're kind of like got springs with them, really stiff springs. They're fixed in place, but they can jiggle, you know, uh, not a very scientific term there. But they can vibrate, but that's all they can do. They can't fly past each other at all. That's what makes them follow the problem. Basically, all solids, say this, well, some people would argue with me, are crystalline structures. Okay, pretty much. A little bit of a weasel word there. All right, now how do you go from being a solid to a liquid? Yeah. Oh, yes, you add energy to it. Now, what does energy do to that hard crystal structure? Break it down. Okay, actually, it makes the vibrations increase. And increase because the more you add heat, the more you add kinetic energy to those atoms and molecules, and you do that, and now you might start breaking some of those. Okay? So what makes a liquid a liquid is it has a definite volume, okay? I can pour this liquid into a measuring cup, I can pour it into your can, I can pour it, it's all, always going to be that same volume of liquid but it'll take the shape of whatever I pour it into. I can pour it into your back, okay? So it'll take the shape of your back. So it modifies its shape, but it still has a definite volume. And why is that? Remember, there's two types of attraction, okay, bonding. One is positional, solid, that's fixed. In a liquid, it's just the proximity bond. That water molecule doesn't let that next water molecule get very far away, but they can slide past each other. They stay close, but they slide past each other. Okay? So only weak 
cohesive bonds are between the component molecules, um, but they, they still have the, the proximity bonds that keep them in the same body. Okay? The constituent molecules are mostly in contact with each other because they still have that proximity bond, hydrogen binding to water, whatever. So now you have not just vibration, you still have vibration, but now they can rotate and limited translation past each other, but they still keep their general proximity. Okay, because they're bound together. This one is not going to get very far from this one, but it's not actually fixed to that or this one or this one. So they slide past each other, but they can still vibrate, they can now rotate, and they can move a little bit further apart and whatever. Okay. Uh, this is a diatonic model, by the way. Okay, two atoms or two yeah, atoms that make up one molecule. Okay, you can have bigger and smaller. Now, how do you go from a liquid to a gas? Yes, add more energy to it. So now you start breaking the proximal you know, uh, bonding that they have to each other and separate them so now they're each one on the free. Free at last, okay? They're, they're floating around. Occasionally will contact each other, but then they just bounce right off each other, okay? So that's what makes a gas a gas. Indefinite volume, indefinite shape, takes the shape of whatever container it's in, and will fill up a container. If I were to have brought in with me this morning a uh, bottle of ammonia, and then right before class had opened that bottle of ammonia and set it there, and then, oh, I've got to go take care of something else, so I'll just wait here for a bit. After a while, the people right in here will go, yeah, you know, who can handle this? And after a while, even Alex back there will know that there's ammonia in the room. It will fill the room. Not real strongly, maybe, but it will be all over the room. Because gases, the gas molecules are free to float, and they get as far away from each other as they can, and that's what makes the gas a gas. Molecules are mostly not in contact. With the liquid, they mostly are. And with the solid, they are fixed each other in their place. Uh, they allow motions of vibration, rotation, just like liquids have, vibrations that liquids and solid have. But now they can translate anywhere they want to, uh, mostly free paths. And occasionally they will collide. And when they do, they have perfectly elastic collision. And they go on about their merry way without being coming back in any fixed uh, position with each other. So this shows monatomic, if looking at this, doesn't have to be, but they're just going anywhere they want to. Okay? Um, and then I thought I would say another thing. Okay. Now, this uh, text doesn't go into the next phase. What was it? Plasma. How do you get from a gas to a plasma? How did you get from a solid to a liquid? Add energy. Liquid to a gas, add more energy. Gas to a plasma, add more energy. Any plasma in the room? Yes, in your tubes here. That's what's giving off the light. You have the capacitors in there, the, the ballast in those in the, the fixtures there, which build up a large potential difference to the different ends of the, the, the uh, tube. Okay? Those things, uh, big potential difference. And then the, uh, I think it's the mercury vapor or whatever they're using as the medium in there, it jumps up an energy level. So what happens? When a gas becomes a plasma, it either loses electrons or gains electrons. So it no longer is an atom, it is now called an ion, which an ion is a charged atom. Either it gained electrons, become a negative ion, or lost electrons, being a positive ion. Okay? And that's what makes a plasma a charged gas, basically. 
and you get it from energizing even more what you've added a lot of electrical energy there which made them that then the ions race back and forth along the tube you know going to the to the optic part you know of the effector right and as they go there's a white what they call a phosphorescent powder if you've ever seen one of these tubes you break you know the that powder that's inside the, the tube that's just a phosphorescent material that when the charged ion goes past it it energizes it and it it, it does, jumps up an energy level okay and uh, this is on the uh, quantum scale of things jumps up an energy level the electron does and then when the ion goes past it falls back down so it picks up energy from the ion as it's going by and then once it's passed it can't maintain that so it falls down a level where it just happens to be the wavelength that's produced when it jumps down that produce, that's fairly close to the white line and that's how it does so that, that white material in there is what is constantly being pumped up and down but it's not the ion itself the, the uh, uh, ionized gas is the uh, mercury vapor or whatever is in there that's the plasma so what would you say most of the universe is yes. okay I heard gas you don't think solid Oh, solid. Not liquid? Oh, liquid, a lot of that. No, the most of the universe is plasma. So, guys, guess what most of our solar system is? Where is all, most of the mass in our solar system? Yeah, our sun. Our star, the sun, like 700 times more massive than all the rest of the solar system together is our sun. And that is incredibly high energy, so just like every gas in there is ionized okay so yeah the stars are ions okay uh, are ionized gases so therefore most of the solar system most of the universe is is plasma now at least that's before they came up with this concept of dark matter and dark energy which i don't really understand well at all uh but that may not be uh plasma probably isn't but in a black hole I don't know I'm guessing it probably is there but it can't much tell from a lot of the uh, stuff but I'd still say it's mostly plasma now they didn't go into plasma here no extra charge there. okay now let's talk about those molecular motions again not the vibrational things those are types of molecular motion but anytime a molecule or an atom or anything is moving it's characterized by energy of motion what is the energy of motion kinetic energy okay but it's uh, characterized by an average kinetic energy over a large sample average kinetic energy over the entire sample now remember I said every molecule is moving some may be moving fast some may be moving slow but they're all moving so what you do, you average the kinetic energy of all those molecules in that large sample. And guess what? That's what temperature is. A measure of the average kinetic uh, energy over the entire sample. Okay? If something is hotter, on average, its molecules are vibrating faster than they were when it was cold. So temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules making up the substance. So, remember we said, is in, uh, in heat and temperature the same? No. Temperature is a measure of average kinetic energy, which is a form of heat, okay? Energy, heat is a transfer of energy. So, uh, temperature would be a measure of the average kinetic energy. So they're not the same thing. It's proportional to the average kinetic energy of the material. Now, there was a pretty nifty experiment, I think the guy's name was Suzu or something like that, rather strange name, I think he was French, uh, but he came up with a real clever experiment, okay? Um, but you know this too, okay? You know this. Gases diffuse quicker at higher temperatures. If I had that bottle of ammonia here, 
and just open the lid and let it breathe, it would slowly fill the space. If I put it on a Bunsen burner or a hot plate at a very low heat, I don't want to get anything going here, it's going to diffuse much, much, much faster. It will be all over the room in no time. Uh, you ladies, and maybe the guys too, if you use cologne, have perfumes, okay? They're basically released when we put it on our skin. The temperature goes up, so they diffuse even faster, okay? You smell as a bottle, you know, but you put it on your skin and they same if you use cologne. <coughs> they break through them fast. <coughs> Okay, so gas is reduced quicker at higher temperatures. Expansion and contraction um, occur with increasing and decreasing temperature. Well, that's true, okay? For the most part, there's one substance that doesn't obey that quite all the time. Most of the time it does. But if you think about this, if a when you increase the kinetic energy, right? Now it bounces more, vibrates and rotates and does everything more energetically. So it bounces the other particles near it further away, so it expands. When it cools, the bounce is less, and now the contraction is closer. Now it's not a huge amount; it's very, very small. Okay, but the expansion and contraction with increasing and decreasing temperature, and you know that happens too, right? And that's why on your pistons, what you have around them? Screens. That allow for, when they go from cold to hot, that allow for the expansion to happen without freezing inside the cylinder. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but that's why those are there. Okay? One reason, anyway. And what was the exception to that? All right, guys. What's the most common material on the planet? Oh, on the surface of the planet. No, elements. I mean, compounds on the surface of the Earth. Most common compounds on the surface of the Earth. Water. Water. Seventy hey. percent of our surface is covered with water, and some of that water goes miles deep. Okay. Water. Water everywhere in the land. I love it. Not necessarily all of it. Now, water is something strange. Most common compound out there on the surface of the earth, anyway. But has so many strange things. It should be a gas. No other molecule with that low of molecular weight is a liquid. Water is because of that strong hydrogen bond. So it's strange in that respect. Okay? It's about the biggest solvent we have. It has the highest specific heat. We'll talk about that later, too. That's why we put it in. What did y'all put water in the car? <laughs> yes, in your toes, because water will explore more heat than any other substance you can put there. Okay? Any other substance. Okay? Helium actually has a higher specific heat than water. We don't need to put helium in there. So that wouldn't work too well. Okay. Uh, but it's not much. Water is there. So, Water is the exception at a certain temperature. And if it weren't this exceptional, we would not have life on the planet. Water, when it cools, of course, it does decrease in its, uh, it contracts as it cools. And it contracts until it gets down to about four degrees Celsius. It's just above freezing. And at four degrees, they're hard. It's hard to expand. The reason for this is water molecules hang on to each other so tightly that hydrogen bonding, they are in such close proximity, but when you get down to the point where they start getting into a crystal structure, which ice is a crystal structure, they start moving the molecules further apart so they can get in this place. When they're sliding past each other, they're actually closer than they are in the crystal structure. So from Four degrees down to zero degrees, they are expanding. And so as ice freezes, it's larger, less dense, you know, it takes up more volume than liquid water does, just before it floats. Now, why is that important? The 
without that life on this planet would probably cease to happen. I mean, that one little strange people, because if that were not true, that water started to freeze as it got smaller, like every other material does, where it would freeze and go to the bottom of the river, of the lake, of the pond, it would freeze from the bottom up. And all life to exist down at the bottom. Okay? So therefore, we would have, because we're all connected in one big ecosystem, if those fish die and those who get everything else dead, the higher animals, they die too. Okay? So it's a really bizarre thing. Water freezes, integrates to the surface, so you still have liquid water under the North Pole. Liquid water's under there. And usually because it freezes and expands, you usually have a little pocket of air there too. So there's oxygen there. So the fishes and everything else can still exist at the bottom of the frozen pond or lake or the North Pole even, you know. So yeah, that's the exception. Water actually in a four degree range expands rather than All right. This was part of Fizzy's experiment. Uh, and what he did, he had probably with carbon, pure carbon, uh, soot, you know, black carbon, you know, in the container here, and he at some he started heating at very low levels, so the carbon started leaving the container. And he has what they call collimators that made it in a very narrow band uh, that as it left, it was going this way. Uh, it hit against the plates and that stuff would do. So a very narrow band of carbon would be leaving this. And he had over here a cylinder, and the cylinder spun, okay? Now, the cylinder wasn't a solid, Completely solid cylinder. It had a little, a little bitty seam that was open. Okay, so one time around, all that carbon coming out would plate on the cylinder until it hit the little gap. And when it hit the gap, that little bit made an end because it was was rotating just a little, a little blur went in. Okay, and inside the cylinder, he put a film that was reacted when carbon or whatever the material was hit it. So then he could tell where the carbon was plated out. And the faster moving, the slower moving carbon didn't hit the sides until it was almost all the way around. The faster moving carbon hit just opposite, you know, and, and it just spread out according to temperature. And this is what it looked like. Okay? The fastest speed in a thousand meters per second played it out on this end of the strip and the slowest moving one moved here and the center was about there. Okay? So he had it going at a fixed speed, constant speed, so every time it would go around you hit plate and then it would build up like that. Then he hit it again with this crank this up a little bit. And what did he see? The pump moved that way. The peak moved this way you would increase in temperature, this way you would decrease in temperature. Because more molecules, there were always a few sweaters, and there were always those that were really fast, but the bulk of them were here, and there, unless you increase the temperature, then the bulk moved that way. Okay? Decrease the temperature, might have to spend a while to get enough on here, but the, the peak moved this way. And he showed that indeed, the increasing numbers played it out. At this end, when the temperature was lower, at that end, when the temperature was higher. Meaning, they were moving faster and plated on the opposite end more quickly. Pretty nifty experiment. Probably took a lot of calibration to get it just right, uh, but interesting experiment. All right, so let's look again at temperature. Again, temperature is a measure of the, and before they were saying average kinetic energy, they're going to use a slightly different term now, average internal energy of an object. See, an object can have kinetic energy if I throw the ball 
to someone. That has some in, yeah. That's not the that's not the change of temperature of much. Okay, we're talking about the internal energy, the vibrations, rotation, all that that's happening to the molecule. That's what temperature is. And generally, it's the measurement. So what is a thermometer measure? Do most thermometers actually measure temperature? No. Say again? Not heat either. What thermometers are measuring, name or describe a thermometer, please. Okay, that's what you're measuring. Okay, it's a, it correlates to the temperature, but you're measuring the thermal expansion of the material. If you have alcohol or or uh, mercury in there, and you heat it up, it expands. Then you cool it down, it, it contracts. So you're not measuring temperature, you're measuring the amount it contracts and expands, and therefore you're, uh, you're measuring the surge expansion, but it relates to temperature, okay? Now that's one type of thermometer you might have. Do I have any other kinds of thermometers you know about? Liquid in a tube. Say again? Digital. Okay, digital. Okay, what? I don't know what's inside a digital thermometer. Something's in there that's measured. And I'll make a few guesses here. And, and I know y'all run into these. Have you ever heard the term thermistor? What are you measuring with a thermistor? Resistance. And resistance goes up when temperature goes up. Resistance goes down when temperature does. And so that's what you're measuring. Not measuring expansion of something, you're measuring electrical resistance. Probably an ohm, but you've got it down there in degrees. Okay? And um, how about the, um, this is you in electronics, this is more like your digital thermometer. Uh, but in the old uh, what was it, thermostat, what was inside every one of them? Did you ever look inside one? Spring? It looks like a spring. It's a coil. Okay? And you know what that coil is made up of? It's what we call a bimetallic strip. Okay? I think, well, yeah, I was wrong. It has one metal on one side and another on the other. And because different metals have different coefficients of thermal expansion, if the one on the bottom has a higher and it heats up and the one on top is less, it's going to expand more and the one on top less, so it's going to be like this, okay? Uh, the bigger the coil, the more it magnifies, the more it turns you have in the coil, the more it magnifies that thing, and that then tilts a little mercury um, capsule that's in there, and it tilts one way, it may turn on the heat, it tilts the other way, it may turn on the air conditioning. That's how those kind of things work, okay? Yeah. Uh, your thermometer that you might hang on the thing, and, and it does like this, it's just got a spring, attached to a coil and you're measuring temperature that way. There you're measuring the expansion of two metals. The difference between the bimetallic strip. Not the expansion of the liquid but not the gas. We'll pick up here when we come back. Yeah. Let's try to keep it five minutes or less, folks. Yes, sir. All right. I did miss one of the little concepts applied here. Um, and I can't remember. Did I give y'all the example before of the basketball in the winter? In, I did do that. Okay, good. Uh, that's the concept applied at the top of the uh, thing here. Uh, they say blow up a balloon so it's nice and tight and you know, tie it off so it can't lose uh, you know, the air and put it in the freezer and uh, refrigerator and suddenly it's a lift balloon. 
bring it back out, and it gets tight again. The molecules are moving. The faster they move, the more they bounce, the further they are apart. The lower the density, lots of stuff are happening today. Okay, so we were talking about temperature, and I started the thing again. Uh, it's a measure of the internal object of the energy. Thermometers are used to measure temperature, but basically what they do is measure some thermometric property, and that then relates. They calibrate that for the temperature. Um, has anyone ever heard of a thermocouple? Okay. And I bet you, and, and this is maybe the answer to Chris's question, on um, what's in a digital thermometer, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there's something like a thermocouple in there, which is probably somewhat similar to a thermistor in that it's an electrical property that changes with temperature, and that's what you're really measuring. So you're really measuring some sort of surrogate property that is calibrated to represent temperature, okay? The example of the bimetallic strip in, in thermostat, I think that's the next figure. This is that bimetallic strip. Uh, brass on the bottom, iron on top. Brass has a higher coefficient of thermal expansion than iron. If you heat up or you ambient temperature goes up, then it starts spinning that way because the brass expands more quickly than the iron can do. That gets into a coil and that just accentuates that, and then your needle or the public. Uh, mercury or whatever it is, uh, shift one way or another. And that's exactly what a thermometer with a with a, uh, a needle on it does. You're measuring a bimetallic strip in there, how much it's expanding. Okay? Now, nothing new there. I think the picture of the thermostat is figure 4.6 in your text is probably what should have gone there and they just didn't, didn't get it in place. Okay? Now, let's now consider a temperature scale. Okay? Anyone want to hazard a guess of who developed probably the first thermometer? Yeah. No. Okay. Galileo? Galileo! Okay, how did he do that? Sunrise, you are smart. <laughs> okay, I do my best. Okay, what Galileo did, he noticed that when, when gases expand, are heated, they expanded, and when they cooled, they contracted. So basically what he did, he took one of those, I don't know if any of you ever had chemistry labs or something, there's a type of a flask, I can't think what the name of it is, sort of bulbous on the bottom with a long, thin neck, okay? Um, and what he did, he filled that mostly with a liquid, but had some air space in it, flipped it over into a pan of water, okay? So that there was always liquid in there, but the, the main part of that was gas at the top, in the, in the big part here. And as the gas heated up, it forced the liquid down into the pan, and when it cooled, it came up. And the thinner the neck, the greater the expansion. He calibrated that for known temperature, and he said, you know, okay. So his thermometer uh, at cooler temperatures, the cool scale was on top, the hotter scale was on the bottom. So it's going down like that. Okay? Uh, now, I don't know if he ever actually came up with a scale on his own. He probably did, but we don't know what it is. By the way, anyone know what WRT stands for? With respect to. There is WRT. Well, um, there was a little bit of a problem with Galileo's thermometer as I just described. Does anyone know what that would it's be? It's open. It what? It's open. What was open? Did you say it was a flat? Yeah, the flask, yeah, but it was the, the top of the flask is down in the, in the, the liquid. But there is something missing. It's liquid, the question. Okay, that does go out to drink. We can handle that. But what about the open pan of water there? 
And he said, open up. All right, right on there. Sam of water was there. What else would he be measuring then? The reason he carried the water in that hand. Okay, but it's supposed to be measuring temperature. That's what he wanted to measure. And it says the water was exposed to the air. The what? Okay. What? The wind? Second. The wind going across? No, no, no. That, that would still be temperature. But, uh, when you're talking about hurricanes, tornadoes, what is there always, or even a thunderstorm, there's usually, uh oh, pressure. Pressure! The pressure, atmospheric pressure, as it changes, it forces the water either in or out, you know. And so he would have a sort of a barometer mixed in with a thermometer. And with a constant change of temperature, you have no change of temperature. If the barometer changed, then the level would change. So it wasn't quite done. So guess who perfected Galileo's thermometer? Newton, who followed Galileo, but Newton, you know, they, Newton was born the year that Galileo died, okay? He studied that and said, hmm, how can we get around that? So he sealed it off so it wasn't exposed to the barometric pressure, and then he had the liquid in a sealed tube, and basically a vacuum at the top, so he was now measuring the, the thermal expansion of the liquid and not the air, okay? And that's why, and that's still the thermometer we use today, is pretty much Newton's uh, thing. Now, Newton did put a scale on it, okay? And he, um, I'm trying to remember, I think this is true, I think he went from the freezing point of water to, I believe, body temperature, okay? And those were the given depths, okay? Now, if we're in lab, would we got down in 259? You know what that is? Okay. 259 is what the lab would be. Okay. All right. Uh, I believe he went, his zero was the freezing point of water, and his, uh, I think he said 10, was the body temperature. Well, that made pretty big degrees there, okay? going from the freezing point of water to body temperature. Think of another sort of problem with that scale. Body temperature Body temperature Yeah, body temperature is not a very constant thing. I worked with a, an engineer uh, when we were doing a project down in Florida, uh, and her normal body temperature was about 96 not 98.6. If she ever got up to 98.6, she was sick because she had a high fever, okay? Her body temperatures are quite, yeah. And nobody is exactly, I mean, not very many people are exactly, but that's an average body temperature, okay? And different things can make it go up, like you exercise much and it comes up a little bit, or you have a cold room like this, Adam probably dropped it, <laughs> okay? Uh, but under his jacket, it's gone back up. Okay, so yeah, that's not a great scale. And the other thing was 10 degrees between freezing point of water and, and body temperature, that's a pretty big thing. So people didn't really call it, uh, use that degree, they started using eighths of a degree. Okay, so they would use, I think I said that wrong, I think he had a 0 to 12 scale. I believe he had 0 to 12. Uh, and they started using eighths of a degree. So they started they started with a half degree, then a quarter degree, then eighths of a degree. And so rather than always saying eighths of a degree, eighths of a degree, they just named that a degree. So if you go zero to twelve in eighths, how many do you get? Twelve times eight. Twelve times eight. Ninety-six. And what's body temperature? 98.6. So yeah, I think that's where what he did. Well, along came somebody else. And his name is a German scientist named Gabriel Fahrenheit. And he liked to deal with low temperature stuff. And in his lab, he used low temperature stuff. 
and he didn't like to have negative degrees all the time. So his minus sign threw him off. So he said, I need a scale that goes lower than freezing point. Oh, okay, yeah, maybe they named it after him, Gabriel Fahrenheit. Now, how did he, how was he making his cold temperature? He was mixing salt. Sometimes I even put liquid with the ice and drop in the temperature. Because when you add a material, specifically salt, to ice, it drops the temperature of ice, the melting point and freezing point of ice. Any of you ever experienced that? Yeah. When? Making ice, Making ice cream. If you put this ice around that container that contains your cream, your milk, your sugar, all that kind of stuff, and turn the crank on with this ice in it, and you can crank all day long and keep adding ice and adding ice, and guess what you have? Cold cream, okay? You have never freeze. Because the primary ingredient in all that stuff is water, but you've got your fats in there, you've got a little bit of proteins in there, you've got sugars in there, you've got other things. All those things are depressing the freezing point of ice that's never going to freeze. So then you put salt on the ice, and if you put salt on the ice, it drops the freezing point and the melting point of the ice until it gets below that of the containers in there, and now it starts to freeze. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and uh, so that's what Fahrenheit was doing in his lab. So he needed a, a scale that went lower. He didn't like the negative numbers. Uh, so he didn't want his zero here at the freezing point of water. He wanted it as cold as it would get in his lab. So he made that his zero. Well, that bumped up the freezing point of water to what? Second. 32 degrees Fahrenheit on the Fahrenheit scale. Okay? And that may have adjusted a little bit and made the body temperature somewhere down 98 points Celsius. It would have been 96, but uh, he, he busted up there. Okay? So he kept that. Now, what did that make the freezer or the board want to water down? 212. A nice round number, right? No, it's strange. 32, 212. What's going on here with these scales? Well, a guy named Andrew Celsius, I think he was Swedish, okay, he said, no, nah, that scale's not all that great. We need to go back to something that we know. Because guess what? You can use different salts and different amounts of salts and other things, and your zero scale is just going to wiggle all over the place. Let's go back to freezing point of water, but then not use body temperature. What did he want to use as his end point? The boiling point of water. Those are pretty much fixed. Pretty much fixed. Use the words there. And that's where in the Celsius scale, it goes from zero, the freezing point of water, to 100, the boiling point of water. Where in the Fahrenheit scale, 212 is the boiling point of water, and 32 is the freezing point of water. So a very different scale. Okay. But we still had the problem. No matter whose scale we use, you still had temperatures down here. And as technology got better and better, refrigerants got better and better, uh, ways of dropping temperature got better and better, you were still in the negative temperature range. And negative temperatures really don't make a lot of sense. Remember, I'm, I'm going to race back here for a little bit. All right. Uh, one more maybe. Oh, not racing as fast as this. Ah, here we go. No? I think I've missed it. Nope, I'm way too far. When I first started talking about the temperature. Ah, here we go. A measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. That's what temperature is, right? Average kinetic energy. Now, what can you tell me about kinetic energy? Anyone remember its formula? You better. Kinetic energy. What your test is over. What's the formula for kinetic energy? Yeah. 
size to go up one number, depending on how the increase in temperature is involved. The Fahrenheit's not so, okay? Because if you think about it, uh, 32 to 212 measures the same change in temperature as 0 to 100 did on the Celsius scale. And 32 to 212 is not 100 degree difference, okay? So we'll get there in just a couple minutes. So, but on Celsius, on Kelvin and Celsius, change of 100 is the, change, is the same change in temperature no matter what scale you are. It's just what you count as the beginning point. That's the only difference on the Kelvin scale. Now there's another scale that's based on Fahrenheit scale that goes down to absolute zero too, and that's called the Rankine scale. But frankly, I've never seen or heard anyone use this that's probably been taught. They made it too advanced. You know, just giving up things. Say again? Yeah, and find the point was the height. Okay, now. So let's look at these three scales on thermometers here. Um, on the Fahrenheit scale, zero was down here somewhere, okay? But freezing point of water was here at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Boiling point of water was up here at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. How many degrees do you have between these two? Hundred and eighty. Eighty. One hundred and eighty degrees. So there's one hundred and eighty Fahrenheit degrees. Uh, I think I've got to get my pen activated. And on for right now, I can do it here. There's one hundred and eighty degrees Fahrenheit between the same two fixed points, freezing point of water to the boiling point of water. That's degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. How many degrees on the Celsius scale are between the freezing point and boiling point of water? 100 degrees. So obviously a Celsius degree and a Fahrenheit degree are not the same size. Okay? Because there's a 100 degree different here on the Celsius scale. But on the Kelvin scale, now a couple things I want you to notice here. When you refer to Fahrenheit or Celsius, notice what you use. Always use a little degree symbol. That indicates temperature. But not on the Kelvin scale. You never talk about degrees Kelvin. Ever. There's so many K. 0K, 255K, 273K, 373K, 5000K, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Three. The test is covering temperature. Yeah. And that will be the last 30 minutes tonight. Yes, but um, uh, for the next 10 minutes, uh, temperature is 40 to 7, what will happen to the Celsius? Okay, wait just a second. Let me get my uh, uh, Celsius marks here. Okay, we're doing, we're starting on chapter 4 right now, then we'll do chapter 5, then we jump, jump to, no, I'm sorry, we don't do chapter 5, we jump to 6, and then we jump to 8. Uh, because we only cover six chapters. And basically we cover three chapters in the first half of the term and we cover three chapters in the second half. The, the, that first chapter was fairly short, but all these other chapters are fairly good size. The electricity magnetism is a really long chapter and the, uh, this chapter is pretty long too. So, uh, we'll pretty much fit in six chapters. If we have any time left over, we may talk about a little bit of stuff in chapter nine in here, which is chemical bonding. And yeah, I know that Melba wants to, but we may not get to Melba. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. We've already been talking about it, and we'll continue. But on the Kelvin scale, no degrees here. But notice between the freezing point and the boiling point, what's the difference there? It's a hundred. So the the, the if you call them degrees, they're the same size as Celsius. So this is 100 K here. Okay, you just don't use the symbol of degrees. So a Kelvin unit and a Celsius degree are exactly the same size 
a Fahrenheit is not the same size as a Celsius or a Kelvin. Okay. Now, so this is the basis um, Oh, is it? Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. What a shame. Okay. Yes, get over it, folks. <laughs> okay. It truly is. The next slide is basically the same slide we just had. Uh, what we'll do next is our conversion formulas. Okay? So that's going to start somewhere about there on page 93 okay now I can guarantee you we have covered enough material to do the first lab in the temperature chapter chapter 4 so that means on Tuesday of next week we will have uh, regular out two and a half hours of class followed by two hours of lab we'll have a chance to do the lab for that one. And that lab, I don't think, will take you a full two hours either. Sorry about that. Um, that first one was about the only one that really came close to taking two hours. Um, and we'll go from there. Any questions before we start the lab? So don't go anywhere. Let me... Um, um, let me pass out the, the labs for you. And like I say, this on paper is the shortest lab we're going to do. One page, but it will take a little bit of time. Fortunately, it's also very short setup. So when we get down there, it won't take that long to set up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I realize what happens now. I couldn't find the labs. I had some copies that I knew I had made, and some copies I still needed to make. Some of yours will say physical science, and some will say physics. It's the same lab. Okay. So let me go on and pass these out to you now. Take one. Everybody got a copy of the lab? Everybody got a copy? All right. All right. If you want to, you can move toward the lab. Now, if there's a class in 259, wait for me and we'll manage something else. But I've got to uh, disconnect my computer and do that kind of stuff. So it's going to take me just a few minutes to get down there. Okay. Let me end the slideshow.
high top person at the top, so it will reach the grass. It's a canopy might want to stick around it. And then I'll go during the last month. You, you don't want to do the lab now? Huh? Okay. Well, I could call security and, and they can come check on them maybe. You want to try to do the test? Yeah. Okay. Are you going to say it? Yeah. Okay, you want to do the testing? Yeah, I need an aspect. Okay. Now, yeah. I can go get smaller screen devices. Would it help to have this light on too? Without it? Okay. Thank you. 
times the e, which is meters per second squared, times another meter, kilogram meters squared per second squared. Kilogram meters squared per second squared is a energy ring. Surface. What are you doing? I don't know what that is. Circumference. No. Diameter. John Brown. <laughs> How about this side? A kilogram meter squared per second. That's not a joule. I know. 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 I I I Three point seven seven meters cubed. Bro, this cannot be saved. Why? What is this? Let me see. Shoot that back here. All right. Hold on. They're injecting something that they're measuring. Yeah, and they are. I told you to keep that stuff out of school, man. Andrew, I mean. Okay. It's full time. Okay. I'm sorry, man. Already trying to do it here. All right. What's the velocity at the top of the arc here? What's the velocity? Yeah. Zero. Right now? Zero. 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 It's going nowhere. Okay. Thank you, Dave Martin. Now, what would your kinetic energy be at the top? Zero. Zero. Why? Because it ain't moving. And what is velocity? And what is kinetic energy? I don't know. Velocity is the opposite of energy. One half. Mass times velocity squared. Since velocity is zero, your kinetic energy is zero. And the mechanical energy at the top. Zero. Me, I'm not at the top of that. Huh? I, I can tell. Okay. 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 All right, a quick second. Or part. Yes, all of the, all of the mechanical energy yourself. is in the form of gravitational potential energy at the top. So that would be whatever you measure, your calculator. KE. Yeah, that's right. And that energy is zero because it depends on velocity. So what's the mechanical energy? Mechanical energy? No, it's a little bit. What is the mechanical energy? Mechanical energy units, please. Joule. Joule. Okay. Joule. Now, this is where people need to be careful because I'm going to release it. Okay. So watch it, folks. Uh, it's not the left area. No, it's it's out of the we'll deal with it. Uh, what I'm going to do is release it from this highest position on top of the stick here. And yeah, here you go. Okay. Oh, wait, that's close. That's a little bit. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Release it from the top here. I get it. All right. Hey. Now, what we want to do is calculate the mechanical energy at the bottom. Or you tell me what the mechanical energy at the bottom was. Mechanical. Yes, because mechanical energy is conserved. It does not change. Okay? Mechanical energy at the bottom is the same as it was at the top. So what is the gravitational potential energy at the bottom? Zero. Why? Because it's at the bottom. Because that's at your zero reference level. <laughs> that minimum displacement, if you look at number two, why is your zero reference level? So if it's zero, displacement, MPH, if H is zero, your GPE is zero. Okay? What do you reckon the kinetic energy is at the bottom? Zero and eight. Really? It's not moving down there, huh? No, it is. Oh, it is, big no, time. Kinetic energy, that would be mm -hmm. the The part? Wouldn't that be? Well, that would be whatever your mechanical is. If your gravitational potential is zero, then all the energy at the bottom is kinetic. All the mechanical energy is kinetic energy. 3.77? Whatever it was. Okay? Now the question is, what is your velocity at the bottom? You want to have a real accurate uh, uh, laser light or something like this, if you can measure that? I doubt it. Okay? Okay? So, we're going to have to calculate that. How do we calculate the velocity at the bottom? Start at the top and stay on it, baby. Yes, sir. Uh, Decide it. Uh, 
the, uh, I lost my writing surface. kinetic energy at the bottom. That's where we're trying to calculate your velocity. What is, why don't we close the door so I don't bother people. Oh, yeah, thank you. Up and down the hall here. So somebody said I talk real loud. Okay. But <laughs> last class. Yes, I remember. I, I'm talking to you. You said that I was talking to you. Okay. All right. What is the formula for kinetic energy? Uh, it's already been asked and answered one once today. Say again. One half times mass of velocity squared. Perfect. Okay. We know the mass. We know one half. We know kinetic energy, right? So let's solve for velocity. What would we do? What's zero? At the bottom? Yeah. Kinetic energy was zero at the bottom. Okay. I was hoping not. It's what? That's kinetic energy for your team. The other team had a different number. So I'm not going to put a number down. But how do I solve for velocity? Trying to solve for this. Okay. And how would I do that? Multiply. Multiply. By two. By two. Okay, done. That gets rid of the two. Divide by, Divide by the mass. And you know what the mass is. You can plug that in. Okay, that gets rid of the mass. And then what do we have to do? Take the square root of this to do the square of that. So that's how we determine what the velocity is at the bottom. Okay, now what was kinetic energy measured in? Joules, and what was the joule? 2.8. Yeah, but no, what was the joule? 2.37. No, the yeah. unit. Oh, uh, it was a kilogram. Kilogram. Meter squared. Meter squared per second squared. All right? Then we divided by meat, uh, mass, and what was mass measured in? Kilogram. Kilogram. So the kilograms cancel out. That gave us meters square per second square. When we take the square root, what do we get? Meters per second, an excellent measure for velocity, right? Okay, so you do the numbers, and that, those are your units. Okay, now. That gave you velocity at the bottom. Okay? Now, the hold on. You have two different teams here, so. Okay. That sounds like a reasonable number. The other team will have a different number. Have y'all gotten it yet? Yeah. Say again? Okay, yeah, I heard that. But uh, does the other team have a number? Okay, that sounds reasonable also. Okay. Let's go back to the lab, folks. Let's go back to the lab. We're going to do the, the second part. Thank <laughs> you. 
Trying to talk loud enough for uh, Samuel to hear me. Uh, I did not. Not what I said. Okay, it could lose all the kinetics and become potential because it couldn't go 
goes back to those meters. That part went to a meter. All the kinetic became potential, it stopped there and then we put it back. When I tagged too far down, there wasn't enough string to let it go back to a meter. So therefore it didn't lose all the potential energy. It kept some kinetic energy. That's why it kept wrapping around the tag. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the why part. to understand what happened there, right? Okay, and what, what does that mean? All the kinetic energy did not become potential because it did go back to the meter, so therefore it kept it in Did someone leave a calculator? Was this one of yours? Oh, we could. Is this one of yours? Oh, okay. Yeah. We could take it either place. Okay, we are finished with the lab. Okay, we're killing time, folks. I, I'm here till late, so uh, I'm happy to stay here. We were going to get our stop, we want to hear what we were doing. Okay. Did you know what? Well, that's tough, okay? It can't be here to get to that. Okay. All right. Now, did everyone get the what, what happened? That goes by answer. The mass wrapped around the peg, okay? The second part, the why, that goes on the next line. Why did that happen? Does everybody get that written down? Okay? Now, question number nine. Question number nine. What conservation principle does this experiment demonstrate? What energy was conserved throughout everything we did in there? Really? I thought kinetic energy started at uh, zero and went to something. That's not conserved. Mechanical energy was conserved throughout in both of the parts of the experiment. Okay? Both of the setups. Mechanical energy was conserved. All right. Now, every team, okay, you filled out your stuff in the blank. You have a little bit of a margin here. And on these four and five, you can write either above or below what's there. But team over here, what was your minimum displacement? The team that was on the left. Second. Point two three meters. So the other team, right in your margin over here, point two three meters. This team on the right, what was your minimum displacement? Point four two. Point four two, is that right? Yeah, point four two meters. Correct. So the team that was over here, you write in your margin there, point two meters by minimum displacement number two. Okay? You write the other number than one you did, and then do all the same calculations with their number that you did with your number. Does that make sense? Yes. So you write down the second number. What were they again? Point two seven and point four two? Point two three and point four two. Okay? If you have written down one of those, you write the other in the margin. Then you calculate the delta H, just like you calculated before, 
Calculate your GPE, velocity, KE, and ME. Write it either above or below. I don't care. On number four and number five, above or below. Fill in a block, you know, a blank above or below. And then when you get that completed, you finish the lab. Okay? You do your own calculations, okay? And then it sounded like to me y'all preferred to go back to the classroom. Or you'd rather be down here? Okay. So what we'll do, once you finish the lab and turn it in, you can go get your stuff if it's up there. Come back down and we'll do the test in here. Okay. I'm going to pause recording for right now.